Hi, my name is Chris Snell with Hewlett Packard Enterprise Storage Division. I'm here to talk about a hot topic, which is persistent storage for Kubernetes running on top of VMware vSphere environments. Many people are already running Kubernetes clusters in various forms on top of VMware. And because of that, VMware has been doing a lot of work to develop integrations into Kubernetes over the last few years. Today, I will be focusing on how to use HPE storage within Kubernetes clusters running on VMware, including Tanzu Kubernetes Grid using cloud native storage on vSphere. With the release of vSphere 6.7 update 3, VMware introduced cloud native storage for vSphere, which exposes vSphere storage into Kubernetes through the vSphere cloud provider and CSI driver. I want to pause here for a moment and talk about the differences between the HPE CSI driver and the vSphere CSI driver, and to help you understand where to use one over the other. The HPE CSI driver provides the full capabilities of the CSI spec and data management capabilities from Nimble or Primera storage platforms for bare metal or virtualized Kubernetes clusters. The HPE CSI driver supports iSCSI and Fiber Channel out the front for file and block volumes for bare metal deployments. For virtualized environments like VMware, the HPE CSI driver only supports iSCSI-based volume provisioning for Kubernetes clusters running on a hypervisor, as there are limitations exposing the Fiber Channel HPA into virtual machines. As of right now, the HPE CSI driver doesn't support NPIV. So for our customers who are primarily fiber channel based and don't have iSCSI available, they can leverage the vSphere CSI driver and the storage policy based management integrations we have with HPE storage to provide persistent storage to their VMware based Kubernetes workloads. Cloud native storage on vSphere uses SPBM to provision vSphere vVol based volumes, also known as first class disks for use by Kubernetes workloads allowing vSphere administrators to define the available storage, which then the user can match the storage to the Kubernetes workload. HPE Primary Storage, HPE Primera, Nimble Storage, Nimble Storage DHCI, and 3PAR has the largest user base of vVols in the market due to its simplicity to deploy and ease of use. And I will show you how easy it is to use HPE storage within Tanzu Kubernetes Grid, as well as Kubernetes clusters running as virtual machines. To get started, let's head over to scod.hpedev.io and click on VMware under Partner Ecosystems on the left-hand navigation pane. The first step is to configure the VASA provider within vCenter for your Nimble or Primera storage array. Once you have that done, there are steps to walk you through configuring a storage policy. Creating a storage policy for Nimble or Primera is very similar and you can customize it to your needs. Here I will show you that I have a policy called Primera Default Policy available. Click on Menu, Policies and Profiles, then VM Storage Policies. In the list I can see the Primera Default Policy is available. With the policy ready, I We'll quickly show you how to assign the policy for use within Tanzu Kubernetes Grid. Once you have Tanzu Kubernetes Grid deployed, you have to create a namespace. Once the namespace is deployed and ready, you can assign permissions to the namespace as well as the storage policy to use. Click on the namespace, then click Add Storage. In the list, I can assign the Primera default storage policy to the cluster and click OK. Once the policy is assigned to the namespace, I can click on the CLI tools in order to get the IP to the cluster that I will use to log into. Note that in order to interact with Tanzu, you will need the vSphere CLI tools to interact with this cluster. Now I'm going to switch over to my terminal. I can log into the namespace by logging into the server IP that I just copied, specifying the username assigned to the namespace, and set the namespace and the cluster information. When I run kubectl get all, you can see all of the pods that have been automatically deployed, including the vSphere CSI driver components. Next, I will check to see which storage classes are available to this cluster. As I can see here, upon assigning a storage policy to the cluster, Tanzu automatically creates a storage class based upon it. If I describe the storage class, I can see that it is based on the Primera default policy. I can now create persistent volume claims based upon this storage class. 
And really, that's all it takes to use HPE storage with Tanzu. The Primera and Nimble Storage SPBM integrations in the cloud native storage make using HPE storage for VMware based Kubernetes clusters a simple task. The next portion of my demo will go into non Tanzu clusters running on VMware. These could include HPE Esmeral Container Platform clusters, vanilla Kubernetes clusters, clusters deployed using Rancher or Red Hat OpenShift, to name a few. And depending on the provider, many of these steps may already be done. I will be using the VMware documentation on SCOD as well as the official documentation from the vSphere CSI Special Interest Group on Kubernetes.io. In order to configure vSphere-based storage for a standalone Kubernetes cluster, it again starts with a storage policy. So I will go ahead and reuse the one that I used within my Tanzu example. Next, I will configure the vSphere cloud provider. This is a step that will be optional depending upon the Kubernetes provider that you used. For example, Red Hat OpenShift and Rancher have automated the configuration of the vSphere cloud provider. Once you have the vSphere cloud provider available, you can deploy the vSphere CSI driver. After which, I will create a storage class and deploy a workload. Finally, I will take a look at the volumes within the new cloud native storage interface within vCenter. In order to provision first class disks to a VM, I first need to enable disk UUIDs on the VMs. So here I have a sample VM that I will edit to show you how it is done. Go ahead and click on the VM Options tab, then click Advanced, and then Edit the Configuration. Click Add Configuration Parameters and name it Disk.Enable UUID and set the value to True. Once you have it set, go ahead and click OK. If you have already provisioned your cluster and you want to enable the vSphere CSI driver, you will need to go and check to see if this parameter exists. If it doesn't, then you will need to shut down the cluster and add the parameters to each of the VMs within that cluster. Now that I have that out of the way, let's configure the vSphere Cloud Provider. First, I will go ahead and list out the nodes in my cluster as I will need them at a later step. Next, I will describe my nodes to check if the vSphere Provider ID is already configured on them. If this is blank, we will need to configure the Cloud Provider. If it returns values for each node, then you can skip directly to deploying the vSphere CSI driver. This is a vanilla Kubernetes cluster, so the cloud provider isn't configured yet. The first step for configuring the cloud provider is configuring the vSphere.conf file. Note that this is a hard-coded file name, so you can't change it. Within the comp file, I will configure my vCenter and specify the user that has permissions to create objects within vCenter. I also set the default port and the vSphere data center to be used. Once done, I will save and exit. Now I will create a config map based upon that file. Next, I need to taint the nodes so that workloads can't be scheduled while I configure the cloud provider. I need to run that against each of the nodes within my cluster. I can verify that the taints have been applied to each of the nodes. Once the cloud provider has been deployed, these taints will automatically be removed. Next, I head over to SCOD and copy the cloud provider manifest. There are three that need to be deployed. These can also be found within the vSphere CSI driver documentation. Once I have applied those manifests, I can verify that the cloud provider has been deployed successfully. Again, I will check for that provider ID. And now I can see that it's available on each of those nodes. I can also see that the taints have been removed. With the cloud provider now deployed, we can proceed with deploying the vSphere CSI driver. The first step there is to create a secret that will be used by the vSphere CSI driver in order to communicate with the vCenter. And it will contain much of the same information as the config map that I created earlier. I will set a unique cluster ID, specify the vCenter, and the username and password along with the data center and port. Once that's done, I will go ahead and save and exit. I will use this file to create that secret. And once the secret has been created, make sure to delete it as well. I can see that the secret is now available to the cluster. I can head back over to the documentation to grab the manifest that I need to deploy. 
you need to verify which version of vSphere you're using here uh, because there's different manifests for 6.7 or 7.0. So make sure that you copy the appropriate manifest. I will apply the RBAC, the CSI node drivers, and controller driver manifest for vSphere 7 in my case. I can verify the rollout status of both the deployment and the daemon set here. I can also check that all of the pods are up and running and if there are any issues. Once everything checks out, I have successfully deployed the CSI driver. Now I want to validate that the vSphere CSI driver works as expected. And I will start by creating a storage class. As with every storage class, I need to define the provisioner that will be used, which in this case is the vSphere CSI driver. The only parameter that I need to define is the vSphere storage policy that we want to use. Again, I will use the primary default policy here. I will then create the storage class within the cluster. Finally, I will make a claim to verify the CSI driver is working correctly. By running kubectl get pvc, I can see the volume is bound and ready for an application. I will use Helm to deploy a MongoDB stateful set with three replicas. Once it is deployed, I can watch the volumes in the pods get created. I'll speed this up, but within a couple minutes, I have three instances of MongoDB deployed. Finally, I verify that the deployment completed successfully, and then I can log into one of the nodes. When I run df-h, I can see that the 50 gig volume was mounted successfully. Finally, I want to see what this looks like within the new cloud native storage interface within vCenter. So if I switch over to the vCenter, I go under hosts and clusters, click on the vSphere cluster, then click on the monitor tab, scroll all the way to the bottom, and you should see the cloud native storage as well as the volumes that were just created. Here I can see the PVCs as first class disks, as well as the VVOL data stores that they are associated with and if they are compliant to the storage policy. I can click on the labels and also see the volumes that are associated with the MongoDB stateful set. I know this was a longer demo, but I wanted to show off all of the options that are available within the cloud native storage when using HPE storage. As always, if you want to learn more about this or the HPE CSI driver for Kubernetes, head over to scod.hpedev.io or to learn more about HPE storage and containers, check out hpe.com slash storage slash containers. Until next time.